Again, we welcome those who are here this evening and those who are viewing online. For those who are online, uh, we are in Acts chapter 5 this evening. Uh, we're going to be beginning at verse 17. Uh, again, uh, if you have any questions about what you have seen or uh, heard this evening and would like to contact us, you can send us an email at Toronto East End Church of Christ at gmail.com. Uh, we will be glad uh, to assist you in knowing what the Word of God says, because that's all we want to do is obey God and to know what He says and to follow Him. Anyway, in our class, we have finished the first 16 verses of Acts chapter 5. Depending on comments and other, way, uh, other things, we may finish this chapter this evening uh, because even though there is uh, some story that to be, to be uh, discussed here, there's not a lot to these stories as far as doctrinal matters that tend to. So we may be able to get through those sections a little faster, but we won't rush through it. And if there are comments, uh, let's uh, not be afraid to, to comment or question as well. So why don't we get uh, verses 17 through 28. Uh, we'll start with uh, Henry, and we'll go to Bill and around. We'll go the opposite way tonight. Why don't we read uh, two verses each, 17 through 28. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is a sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with the indignation. And then they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison. And taking them out, he said, Go stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders and the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported. We found their prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. Henry. So one came and told us in saying, Look, the men whom you put in the prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, and that's where they should be stolen. When they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Okay, so the apostles have been arrested again. How did they get out of prison this time? Angel of the Lord. An angel of the Lord uh, released them. Remember the first time they were arrested, the chief priests released them the next day. Uh, and... Uh, this time, but they've been told, remember before, don't preach, don't preach in Jesus' name. And, of course, the apostles were going to disobey that. But this time, an angel of the Lord is going to uh, release them. Knowing, uh, we, uh, knowing this was a miraculous uh, event here, what, how did this release seem to... Um, let me see if I can ask this right. The guards, the guards who were out in front, who were guarding the prison, did, did, do you believe that, th that this prison break, in one sense, they knew about? The yeah. yeah. No, they didn't know about it. And so we could come along and maybe conclude that the angel didn't release them through the front door. Through the, 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 through the door, the guards didn't see it, or they caused the guards to the angel caused the guards to sleep. We we can speculate how this was done. It was miraculous, nonetheless. The guards didn't know, and we think of jail cells as as um, the police stations we have today. They're on the same level. I don't believe that's how uh, 
the types of jails that we read of in the New Testament. They're more like dungeons that we read of in old times. So the, the guards wouldn't be standing there, and the bars were right there, and they could just watch the prisoners. But you can't get out of those dungeons uh, except through the front door normally. And so they went to, the, they, they went to get them, but they weren't there. And they said well, the prison was shut, the keepers were standing at the door, and when we went in, no one was there. Uh, and what did the chief captain do uh, when the high priest and the captain of the temple heard these things? Uh, what, what, did, what was their reaction? They were greatly perplexed. Um, and where were the apostles? They were in the temple preaching. It says, these guys said that they didn't let them go. These guys said, obviously, that they didn't leave their posts. And yet these people aren't there. They're in the temple. They're preaching. And so uh, the captain with the officers brought them without violence, again, because they feared the people. It's the same thing that they did with Jesus. They could not bring Jesus in daylight towards the council, arrested him, because the people would have a problem. But the apostles went willingly, even though they weren't going to obey the council in not preaching. Even here, they didn't disobey the, 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 their rulers. The officers asked them to go. They went. Um, but uh, we know that they weren't going to obey if the council was going to say, you can't preach. And it's an interesting... It's an interesting um, conversation in verse 28. How did the high priest, what did the high priest accuse them of doing in verse 28? It's sort of towards the end of verse 28. Yes, there's two things. First part, he accuses them of breaking what they'd already told them not to do. Yes. And then the second part, Okay, yeah, two things. Yeah, you're not obeying us. You're not obeying us. That was the first thing. And the second thing was, not only are you not obeying us, you're accusing us of killing him. That's a very amazing statement because of what happened just four to five months earlier. Uh, let's go back to Matthew chapter 27 and over to Tammy. Uh, do you want to get Matthew 27 verses 33 to 35? Or sorry, 23 to 25. Then the governor said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. And Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising. He took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Okay, about five to six months earlier, depending on how much time has passed uh, between Matthew 27 and Acts chapter 5, they said to Pilate, well, because Pilate was saying, I don't find any fault in him. There's no reason to crucify him. But just like the, just like the chief priests were afraid to arrest the apostles in broad daylight, Pilate was afraid of a tumult, a, a riot over this. And he said, fine, I'm going to wash my hands of this. Now, just because he did it doesn't make it so. But I'm going to wash my hands of this. Uh, we, get, we use that phrase today, same sort of thing. And I'm going to, it's going to be your fault. And they said, fine, it's our fault. Not only will it be upon us, it will be upon our children. And what a thing to say, to, to come along and say, well, it's not only going to be our fault, our children are going to be blamed for this too. And we'll, we'll, they'll accept it. No, they weren't there, uh, at least the younger children. So it really wasn't fair for them to say that. But six months earlier, they were accepting blame for Jesus' death. And now they don't want any part of doing it. They, 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 they have selective amnesia. Uh, it wasn't our fault. It was the Romans that did it. The Romans killed him. It was a Roman cross, a Roman governor. And 
we're going to get Peter's response to this. It's a very famous verse, and it's a misused verse from time to time. He's saying Peter's going to respond to this very accusation. Let's read verses 29 to 32. Let's read uh, one verse each. We'll start with Naomi. Back in Acts 5. How many verses each? One. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers remains now Jesus of whom we murder, and any on our feet. For he is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior, to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Okay, so the most mis some of the, sometimes the most misused verse here is verse 29. It's the first part of Peter's co comment because remember there were two accusations. Uh, you're, you're, you're disobeying us. You're disobeying the council. And he said we ought to obey God rather than men. And we had made this point a few weeks ago, but we'll make it again. Peter had no other choice but to disobey the council. The reason is the council said to stop preaching. When we come along today and the government tells us something is right when we know it's wrong and it, in, in this day and age it's re, in regards to homosexuality and people come along and say well I have to obey God rather than men. Yes that's true and no we cannot accept homosexuality people practicing homosexuality as being righteous before God. We cannot do that. Romans chapter 1 would tell us so. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 would tell us so. It is sin. I do not have the right to change what is sin. However, when if, if the government was to come along and tell the church, you have to accept homosexuals as members of the congregation, we have to obey God rather than men. But, if the if the uh, government came along at our job and says, as part of your job, you have to sign the documents for this marriage license. Now, in good conscience, people can't sign those things. But here's the difference. They have a choice to leave their job. We cannot choose to disobey the government as our first option. It has to be our last option. And so when we have, when we are in situations where someone comes along and says, you have to do something, we must sit back and examine, even if, it, even like as far as, even if it takes a little bit, what are my choices here? Well, I can't sin, that's, that's, choice, that, that's choice number one, and I won't do that. Choice number two, maybe I'll disobey the government and keep my job. But people come along and they avoid choice number three because they say, well, God wants me to work. And yes, he does. But he doesn't demand that we have this job over another job. We need a job. And we should, in this day and age, maybe avoid certain jobs that we know we're going to put ourselves in situations where things might be asked of us that we cannot do. Um, and so when it comes to this verse we always have to see is there another way out because Romans 13 says to obey the government obey the government and Peter obeyed the government he came before the council when they were called upon he didn't come along and say well we know what the council is going to say they're going to tell us to stop preaching so we won't go no he went to the council to listen to what they had to say. He was going to be arrested. He went. He obeyed them. But he said, we ought to obey God rather than men. And then in verse 30, he's going to come with the second part of the charge. Who did he lay the blame on in this context for Jesus' death? Those there who he was speaking to. The chief priest was there. The, the council was there. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. In other words, Jesus isn't dead, but it's whom you murdered and hanged on a tree. Now, the Romans physically did these things. But he said, 
it was your fault. Pilate would not have crucified Christ without the Jews bringing him to him. Paul, or Pilate wouldn't have crucified Christ had the Jews just backed off after they brought him to him. He says, it was your fault, but even though you murdered him, even though you were uh, partakers in him being crucified, God raised him up. He has exalted him with his, uh, uh, at his right hand to be the prince and the savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. In other words, God has taken what you have done, the sin that you have done, and he has used that to save. Jesus is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the, because of his death, people can repent and receive the forgiveness of sins. They could not do that before. That did not, though, exonerate the Pharisees, did not exonerate the council and the chief priests for what they had done. However, they could be, have their sins remitted by the very person they murdered. They, if they repented, could be saved by Jesus Christ. That's the irony of it. They murdered him. They were guilty of that crime, but God would forgive them if they'd only repent and obey him. They could do that. And Peter makes the point, we're witnesses of this, and so is the Holy Spirit. Not only are we witnesses of it, God is witness of it. And God has given the Holy Spirit to those who obey him. Now again, we, we do remark, different between the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit. Uh, this, is, this is common talk between, well, what does it mean to be given the Holy Spirit? Well, again, is it, it, is it the gifts of the Holy Spirit or is it the gift of the Holy Spirit? We've, ta we've talked about salvation. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you've received salvation. We are guided by the Holy Spirit by the word. We are, the, the Holy Spirit dwells in us if we are righteous. Does that mean he physically dwells in our body? No, the Holy Spirit is spirit. But he guides us. He lives with us the same way we live with God if we abide in him spiritually. Remember, we, this in, the entire New Testament is based on a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual spiritual uh, everything it's a spiritual church it's a spiritual sacrifices all of it we, we, we sometimes get focused on the physical and somehow people come along and say well the Holy Spirit takes over my life in a sense the Holy Spirit takes over our lives because we obey in other words we have given our lives over to Christ we have said we're going to obey Christ we're going to do what he wants. So in that sense, yes, Jesus takes over our life, but he doesn't physically come in and force me to obey him. Doesn't, he's not, he doesn't become our, our new soul and, and guides us that way. No, he guides us by the word, the truth. Holy Spirit dwells in us, walks, we walk with God. All of these things, but they're spiritual things. Are we, uh, any comments up to this point? Bill. I just thought, you know, earlier you pointed out that the Pharisees were willing to have Christ's blood on them. Mm -hmm. They care less. They wanted him to get But I find it interesting now they don't. Mm -hmm. and, and you wonder if maybe everything that they had saw Jesus do, they were ignoring, and now the apostles with the power of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus isn't isn't going away. Mm -hmm. this, this teaching of Him isn't going away. No. It almost seems like we're a little worried. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like as far as, and especially when we hear what Gamaliel is about to say yeah. later on. Yeah. And and they thought, I'm pretty certain they thought, if we kill him, that'll be it. Yeah. It will be done. And and so it doesn't matter that we we we. It goes to, it goes to what Jesus said as far as the things that come out of the mouth defile the man. Uh, like as far as our tongue can get us into trouble because uh, of the things within that comes out of our mouth. Sometimes when we're in the heat of the moment, we say things that we would normally not say. 
They were so filled with hate. They were so filled with rage, and I think a lot of the crowd was, you get that crowd riot mentality, and, and the, the leaders of the crowd, and everyone follows them, and what are we doing here? Oh, we're here for a crucifixion. Oh, crucify him. Like as far as the chief priests and the elders and, and the council, they were the ones leading the riot. And the people who were there were just as guilty, but you get that riot mentality where everyone just follows, and in the heat of the moment, oh yeah, sure, we'll take responsibility for this. And then later, when it didn't go away, hold on, they're going to blame us. And that's not going to be good either, uh, because they just couldn't stop it. Any other comments? Well, let's read verses 33 to 40. Whose turn are we at? Uh, I think it's you, Naomi, if we read around. Why don't we read two verses each, 33 to 40? When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But the Pharisee of the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to the men of Israel, Take heed to yourself what you intend to do regarding this man. Some time ago, to a tutor shows up, named to be somebody, a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to listen. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and not them God. Oh, so the, the, this is Gamaliel. And we do need to remember Gamaliel, because he's going to come up later in the book of Acts. Uh, he is a teacher of the law, a doctor of the law, or a lawyer, we would say. Uh, like as far as we, we have doctorates today. They're doctors. Now, they're not medical doctors, but they're, they're ones who are educated in the law. And the council was wanting to kill them. This seems to be their reaction to, to this sort of thing. They get angry. Let's kill them. Let's just get rid of them. And they did the same thing to Jesus. And I think Bill's point from earlier is going to really be brought up in the way Gamaliel advises the council. Like as far as they, they, they kill Jesus because they thought that it would just go away after that. And what was Gamaliel's advice? If you were to sum it up in one word, what would his advice be? Relax, leave more. Yeah, relax. Be patient. That's two words. Be patient. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Mine was two words. I wasn't making fun of you. I was saying, uh, I was saying, uh, I said, be patient or patience. Have patience. He said he, got, he gives them two examples. He gives them about Thutis. He boasted of himself that he was somebody. And about four hundred people joined themselves to him, followed him, and then he was killed. And as many who were following him. They were just scattered abroad, and nothing happened because of that. It ended. And then he said, in Judas, Judas of Galilee, in the days of the census, that would be the census we read of in Luke 1, Luke 1 and 2, uh, the, at, least, at least from the commentaries, that seems to be uh, the same, uh, uh, the consensus as to when this time period was, that the, the, we read of the census in Luke, I think it was Luke 2, uh, about the time when Jesus' uh, parents came to Bethlehem. And so if it's the same census, that would again be about 30 to 33 years earlier. But there was this man named Judas. He was from Galilee. He drew a lot of people. And when he died, same thing happened. And so if, if they follow the pattern, well, you kill him and then his disciples would go away. But that didn't happen here. This man died. Now, they didn't believe that Jesus rose again, although they, had, they knew he did. They didn't want to admit it. 
but they knew he did because they had to bribe the, the, the Roman soldiers to, to say that the apostles stole the body uh, because they knew it was gone. But the, um, he said, let the apostles be. Uh, give the apostles enough rope and they'll hang themselves with it. In other words, let them just teach. If it is from men, it will be over soon enough. And everyone will be happy. But if it's from God, you can't win. You can't fight against God if it's from God. Now, on its face, this seems like good advice. We come along and say, well, he's right. If it is from God, we can't fight against God. And if it's from men, it will disappear. That's true. Is there anything you see wrong with Gamaliel's advice, or at least lacking from his advice? He's kind of saying, too, just to ignore the process. He's not seeing really what they're saying. Yeah. He, he didn't come along one thing. If it's from God, we need to obey it. He didn't come along saying that. If it's from men, well, then it's not from God, and we don't need to obey it. But if it's from God, he didn't come along and say, well, then we need to obey it. Uh, well, that was one thing. But I, I come along and say, God won't accept neutrality. In other words, they needed to take a stand. If we remember the, not only what Jesus said, but what happened in the book of Revelation, God doesn't accept middle ground. There is truth and there is error. There are some people who teach about gray areas, that there is this middle ground, and this is the compromising ground. There's no compromise with God. It's either right or wrong. And if it isn't right, it's wrong. Uh, that, that's, that's what the, we create gray areas. We come along and try to rationalize and compromise. And in sometimes compromise is good when it is an area that God has given us the right to compromise. But when it comes to truth and when it comes to righteousness and godly living, there is right and there is wrong. And if we can't determine whether it's right, we shouldn't do it. That's, that's the whole point of the issue. Let's get some verses on this. Uh, we are to Naomi, Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, and Henry can get Revelation 3, verses 15 and 16. So Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is a phrase we often use. Who is not with me is against me. Now, that's not always true in our lives. In other words, sometimes there is... Uh, a middle, a middle ground answer to our, to our problems. But if we're not with Christ, we're against him. That's, that's just the point. If we are not a Christian, we are against Christ. Now, what, are we actively against Christ? Maybe not actively. Some people are. They're actively against Christ. They, they, they will battle uh, Christians. They will try to get people not to be Christians. But then there are those, those, those who are passive followers. Jesus said, if you are not with me, you are against me. And he who gathers not with me scatters abroad. Jesus doesn't give a middle ground. It's not, well, you're either with me, you're a, you are against me, or you're sort of in the middle. You're a little bit with the devil, and you're a little bit with me. Well, when it comes to salvation, you're either completely saved or completely lost. You're not halfway there. Now, in one of his parables, he says you are close to the kingdom. He told, he told in Matthew chapter, was Matthew chapter 13, no, 12. Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark chapter 12. At the end, he told one of the scribes, you're close to the kingdom. But was he there yet? No, he wasn't there yet. He was still outside the doors. And as long as he was still outside the doors, he wasn't accepted. Close is not enough. We sometimes sing the song, almost persuaded, almost, but lost. You cannot be almost a Christian and be a Christian. You're either a Christian or you're not. Uh, Henry, you want to get Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. This is the, written to the church of Laodicea. And know your works, and if you are least a cold in your heart, 
to wish you a cold of heart. So then, because you are lukewarm and miss a cold of heart, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Why would, why would it be better that a church was cold or hot? In other words, if we, if we interpret this to say cold meaning that they're in error or hot meaning they're following God completely, why would it be better for them to be in error or them to be righteous and not sort of this middle ground? Why would it be better? Because and it could cause a lot of other people to lose their souls. Could do that. Uh, if if I was if I was a non-Christian, trying to find a the, the church, I'd want to know. In other words, there's a distinction. You can tell the difference between hot water and cold water. Lukewarm water is sort of that middle in between ground. I want to know if a church is following God or not. And when you get a church that's sort of in the middle, it's hard to tell. Are, 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 is the church following God? Do they have a lot of righteousness but a little bit of error? Do they have a lot of error? No. They're, we want a distinction. Cold or hot? God would have said, I would rather you be in error and be completely in error and we can call you to repentance and you can come back. Or... Ideally, I'd like you to be hot. I'd like you to be righteous and uh, completely following me. I don't want you to be lukewarm. Who here drinks, well, some people might drink lukewarm water. I typically don't. I, I, I don't drink lukewarm water. I drink cold water. I like cold water. If you use hot water in tea. If you use lukewarm, tepid water in tea, I don't think you'll get a pretty good tea, uh, if you, especially if you allow your hot tea to cool down. It doesn't taste the same. He said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He, said, I, he wasn't going to accept them in error, but he's saying, be, be one or the other. Don't try to be this middle ground. Be one or the other. There's no compromise with God. There's no neutrality with God. So in essence, Gamaliel's advice even though on the surface seemed like good advice, really wasn't that good advice. If it was great advice, Gamaliel would have come along and said, look, we killed Jesus Christ, and he didn't go away. His apostles are still here. That should tell us this is from God. Because these two other examples, Judas and Judas, when they died, their, their apostles went away. Their disciples went away didn't happen here. This is five to six months later and we're still dealing with these fishermen from Galilee who are preaching Jesus Christ, who are gaining more and more and more followers. This has got to be from God and we should stop fighting against it because if it's from God we can't win. That would have been the better advice. Any comments up to this point? I've always got to, I've got to look up at that clock and adjust as to when to when uh, it's a good time to stop. I think we've got about five minutes, so I usually stop. It seems a bit like the demons that James talked about and they believe, but Gamaliel yeah. might he obviously he recognized something yeah. of God, but like you said... Was it wasn't going to obey. No. no and, and, and as I said, bet, better advice would have been, let's follow this. Mm -hmm. uh, because his two examples, you could have taken Gamaliel's same stories and say, look, Thutis and Judas, we know they were from men because they came to nothing. But Jesus, this isn't going away. This has got to be from God. That would have been better advice. So let's get these last two verses. Uh, who are we to next? Uh, I think Bill. Why don't Bill and Tammy each get one verse, uh, Acts 5, verses 41 to 42. So they went on their way, so this is speaking of the apostles. Yeah. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Okay. They had just been beaten. 
I have to laugh in one sense. It's not a laughing matter, but you see the attitude here. Well, we won't kill them, but we'll beat them. So they beat the apostles and then let them go. Gamaliel had said, just, just ignore them and they'll go away if it's not from God. But they, said, they just couldn't. They just couldn't let them go and just nothing. Well, they beat them. And so the apostles' attitude was this. They rejoiced at being worthy to suffer shame for Christ. That's something people don't like to do today. People are afraid. Oh, what happens if someone tells me that I'm wrong? Or what happens if I cannot answer every question of the denominationalist or every question of the atheist? What am I going to do? The apostles didn't have that. The apostles didn't come along and say, oh, the council are... They really don't like us. And they weren't discouraged over this. You might think a beating, being thrown in prison, that you'd get discouraged over this. The apostles, I'm not saying they enjoyed being, being uh, beaten, but they counted themselves worthy to suffer shame. It was shameful what they had to suffer, but it wasn't shameful that they suffered, if you see the difference. Let's get a couple verses uh, before we close, let's go to Naomi to get 1 Peter 4, verses 12 to 16. And then uh, Henry can get Philippians 1, 27 to 30. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a meddler. And if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So verse 12. Don't think it strange that these fiery trials that try you come. Don't think it's strange. It's going to happen. And you have been partakers of Christ's suffering, but if you are partakers of Christ's suffering, you're going to have exceeding joy when he comes back. If you have been reproached for the name of Christ, you're to be happy because the glory of the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. He said, on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. And then he comes, Peter comes along and says, Therefore, don't suffer as a murderer. Don't suffer as a thief or uh, uh, someone who is uh, just meddling in other people's affairs. Don't suffer as those things, because those are evil. If you're going to suffer, suffer as a Christian. And don't be ashamed of it, but glorify God. That's what the apostles did here. Don't be ashamed to suffer for Christ. We don't like suffering. We like having an easy life. We like being comfortable. Sometimes it's better not to be comfortable. If we are persecuted, we need to count, we, we need to be glad, not at the persecution, but that we have the opportunity to stand for Christ, to teach Christ. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 to 30. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that when they come and see you for an absence, and may hear of your affairs, and you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversities, which is to them a proof of the perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. But to you, and it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Okay, so let our conduct be as becoming, uh, becometh the gospel of Christ. In other words, behave like a Christian. You're a Christian, behave like it. Stand in the gospel and don't be terrified by your enemies. 
Don't be terrified by them. Don't be terrified by the devil because salvation is from God. And you are saved if you, if you continue. But he, he makes a point here. To be a Christian is not just to believe in him. It is to believe in him. But it's also to suffer for him. There will be sufferings, persecutions. It not always comes in the form of beatings. It doesn't always come in that form. But there are persecutions that we face. And we need to stand firm in our faith, even when persecutions come. Paul tells the Philippians, you've seen it in me. I'm in jail for Christ. Now you, if persecutions come, you suffer for Christ too. Know that it can be done. And what is it said of the apostles? They didn't stop preaching and teaching Jesus Christ everywhere. That was the determination of the apostles. That should be our determination today. Any comments before we uh, close this evening? Just like in Gamaliel, you know, maybe we need to be thankful for Gamaliel. Because if he'd allowed them, if he'd have said nothing, Peter and they'd have been killed. You know, all the Lord works in mysterious ways. I mean, Gamaliel mm -hmm. kept them alive. Yeah. Now, we know we know God wouldn't save all of the apostles. James will be killed, no. but not yet. But in this case, but not yet. Yeah. Acts chapter twelve is going to be many years later. We 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 think of this book and we say, oh, a couple years. No, this book covers a period of thirty years, and so when we get to Acts chapter twelve, we're still talking a few years, not many years. And most of the book takes place. Most of the time in the book covers from Acts thirteen to Acts twenty two or Acts 21, that's the many years that are covered in this book where time just goes by so quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're still not talking months when we get to Acts 12. And so yes, Gamaliel spoke up. Peter and the apostles were saved from death. This is still the infancy. Oh yeah, this is still the infancy. We're, we're, when we get to Acts 5, we still haven't had the dispersion. Uh, Acts chapter 8 is going to give us the dispersion where the gospel is just going to spread out of Jerusalem. And from there, the time period picks up. The time span picks up. It, we, we start going faster through history from the remainder on, and as we accelerate even further, starting from really Acts 11. I, I said 13. It's really Acts 11. And onward, we start accelerating. People don't realize, too, Acts chapter 9 is two years. And the only reason why we know Acts chapter 9 is two years because Galatians chapter 1, Paul says it is. Uh, and uh, so Acts chapter 9, we think, oh, Paul was converted and, and, and then he went to Jerusalem. Paul said, no, I was converted. Then I went out into Arabia and two years later I came to Jerusalem. And so uh, th this book is going to start picking up. But we're still in its infancy. And when we get to Acts chapter 6, it's only 15 verses. 15 verses next week, and if Bill wanted to do an overview of the Old Testament, Acts chapter 7 is the biggest overview. Like as far as, it, it is just a history. Acts chapter 6, we're going to be dealing with trouble in Jerusalem. We're going to meet a man named Stephen. And Stephen is going to be uh, the main character for the ch a chapter and a half. And then he's going to be killed. But there's going to be trouble in Jerusalem, and it, the trouble is predictable. It's a difference between Greeks and Jews. There was going to, there was, the church took care of widows who were Christians, but there was a problem. Some were being taken care of and some were being neglected. This was going to be a problem. It was going to be a test for the church in Jerusalem. How would they handle it? And so we'll take up with that, and that will lead us into the story of Stephen and Acts chapter 7. Uh, it, everyone who is here tonight has obeyed the gospel, but perhaps there are those who are listening who have not. We would love to study the Bible with you. The brethren here in Toronto would love to study the Bible with you so you could hear it and obey it before it is everlastingly too late. What does the Bible say you need to do? You need to hear the word of God. You need to believe it. You need to repent of your sins. Confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you want to study, 
send us an email at Toronto East End Church of Christ at gmail.com. We will set up a study. If we can't set it up personally, if you're out of the Toronto area, we'll find someone who will. We want you to be saved by following the scriptures.